and welcome back. Let's do a shop talk for February 2022. First of all, I have a quick follow up to the boring bar video that I did recently because a comment came up that the two flats that I machined or ground onto the carbide shank reduced the stiffness. That is very true, absolutely true. Um, re reducing the material cross section will always uh, reduce the stiffness. But is it as significant as like 20% or more? I had my I had some minor doubts, so I, I did some uh, FEM work on on Fusion 360, and what you hear in the background is a jackhammer from a contractor doing some construction work. So that's brilliant for filming, but it is what it is. So let, let's look at CAD CAM here. I ground these flats on the boring bar. A, a bunch of people mentioned in the comments that this decreases the stiffness of the boring bar and yes that's true that's absolutely true we are decreasing the cross section in this direction vertical direction and the vertical direction is, is what's important for stiffness in this direction but how much is it is it like um, like uh, mentioned like 20 percent less stiffness that sounded a little bit much to me, so I instead of doing the whole experiment again with uh, on the on the bench with the water bottle and and uh, indicator, I decided to use some high tech here, and we go into fusion, and we have some load simulation here. So I defined a round bar, 100 millimeter long, 10 millimeter diameter. Material is steel in this case for the simulation. And I loaded it with, an, with 10 newtons, which is one kilogram of force on Earth, roughly. And I got a deflection of 0.033 millimeters, so 33 micron, which is pretty close to what we got at the bench with, with our setup and relatively similar numbers. So that's a good, good baseline test. And then I went out and I modeled a second boring bar. Same, same length, same, same diameter, but with two flats. Uh, 0.5 millimeter flat on both sides, so it's overall only nine millimeter high. And I loaded this one too, and I get a deflection of 0.03477 millimeters, so something like 12 micron more deflection than a solid round bar without the flats. So the difference here, there is a difference, of course. Yes, um, it, it's uh, obvious. Every mechanical inclined person will see that this bar is less stiff than uh, without the flat. But the effect of these flats is, let's say, not very significant. And the, the fact that these flats orient the boring bar very nicely in my tool holder blocks compared to the little bit of added stiffness, I'll take the alignment, the easy alignment over this little bit of stiffness in this case. So I hope this, this cleared things up. So let's, let's do something else. That was my take on the stiffness on the boring bar. And also I was asked if it wasn't easy if I just bought a Chinese uh, carpet shank boring bar. Uh, to be honest, I didn't know that um, there are super cheap carbide shank boring bars are available but in this case it was like maybe an hour of work in total plus a little bit additional time for filming and I like to do project like this just as a distraction from my regular customer work making the boring bars a little tool making project like this or like a skill building project for me I can try new things. I, I never have braced the carbide shank with with the 45 degree cut together like this and got it a, I got a good alignment and by the way the 45 degree cut if, if that wasn't clear that's just to increase the surface area of the solder joint. You could also taper do, do a tapered bore and a tapered shank on the carbide and solder them like this. Robin Rossetti showed this on uh, carb on inserted boring bar heads that he made. So this is just for me 
this is playtime for me when I make something like this. Uh, this is purely not a business decision, apart from it being 166 euros if I bought it from Hoffman Group. I, thi I think uh, that beat this boring bar to death. So let's look at my notes. I have a little, I have a very simple trick for tapping on the mill, uh, hand tapping on the mill that I can show you here. So another trick. This time it's about tapping small diameter threads and blind holes. You can do that with machine power. You can use a tapping head. You can use the DRO and watch your numbers and be very careful about it. But in some cases you want to hand tap but use the machine as a guide. And there are very fancy things out there for, for guiding taps. But if you have a drill jack, that's good enough to guide your drill. And for sensitive tapping that way, I, all, I, all you need is something round with a set screw and a hole in it. Uh, preferably knurled on the outside. And your tap, uh, you grind a flat on your tap. This does not need to be a precision surface. I do this just by freehanding again against a grinding wheel. And you, you put your, your tapping handle on here. The flat is just there, so the set screw has something to grab on and doesn't uh, free spin. So that's, that's all the preparation that's needed. And for actual tapping, you just need your drill chuck either in the tool post or in your tailstock. You put your, your tap in the chuck and you, you tighten the chuck until it's almost tight. So you just can barely move the tap in and out and spin it. And this allows you to, to use the machine as a tapping guide without any additional uh, accessories. Then you can just tap your M3 blind hole in 14301 304 stainless and the drill and the drill chuck here in the back keeps this whole arrangement aligned and you're tapping straight if you want to use this technique with a slightly larger tap you can do that too you could use uh, machine power to unwind it but Double check with a thread gauge. That's very nice. That's the no-go side. It's a no-go. And then I have a screw, M3, with two nuts jammed up against each other and set here to my thread depth, plus a little bit, just so I have a little bit of of air and this is what I use to check if my thread is deep enough. If the nuts screw all the way up against the face of the part I know that my threads are deep enough. That's a little bonus trick here. A uh, very cheap solution. Good idea to file or turn the face of the screw flat because usually if these are rolled threads, which they are usually, they have a little bit of burr and stuff like that. You don't want that in your brand new thread here. If you need a little bit more torque, you can use a tapping handle like this. Uh, this is, by the way, cool. It has a small bubble in it, uh, a while, so you can tap level straight down. Um, made by Garant or sold via Garant. And... Uh, it's, it's in the Hoffman catalog. And on the tap you grind two flats square to each other, kind of squarish. You can also freehand it. And this allows you to have, to use a, a tapping handle and transfer a lot of torque this way. I use this to tap in titanium and titanium is notorious for taking quite a bit of torque. That's also the reason why this is a tap where every, every, every 
other tooth is removed to reduce friction and tendency to, to seize up in the thread. So that's the, the high torque version and this is the low torque version. Same trick here on the milling machine. Uh, I'm tapping an M2.5 in aluminium. And all I do is I loosen the drill chuck up here a little bit and I have tap here free floating and free spinning and a little bit of alcohol for lubrication and then I just tap like this hand tap uh, the only thing that you need to be aware of that uh, while you're handling all of this the drill chuck doesn't get too loose otherwise uh, you, you're able to, to push the tap off, off axis pretty far. But this way you can tap very safe. I tapped down to M1.2 or something like that with this technique and basically never had a tap fail on me. Same for tapping uh, zero, zero dash 80 in titanium worked just fine this way and again here the little flat for my uh, knurled tap wheel for the set screw to hold on to very simple and that's a very low effort way of tapping very straight and very secure without any danger of breaking the tap apart from having a dull tap and breaking it that way next up is ultrasonic cleaner i think i showed my ultrasonic cleaner in the past but over the years, I didn't have the ultrasonic cleaner in the shop and I didn't use it a terrible lot. But with the new shop, I dedicated a small area on, on one of the benches for the ultrasonic cleaner and, and its surrounding equipment. And I want to show you the idea behind that. I had this ultrasonic cleaner for a very long time now, probably the better part of 10 years. And it's still going strong, but over the last years I learned quite a bit in, in using them. In the past I just took parts that were dirty as heck and threw them in and had them cook with the ultrasonic on for like half an hour. And sometimes it worked excellent and sometimes I ruined parts that way. Either by uh, damage from the ultrasonic itself or from very aggressive cleaners that I used to use. In the past, I, I always had a acidic cleaner in there. And the acidic cleaner just damaged parts over time, especially when you run them very hot. They tend to eat steel away, aluminum. Uh, if you threw in parts that were black oxide finished, the black, black oxide finish was gone. And also uh, polished surfaces were dull afterwards. So I stopped using that and I kind of stopped using the ultrasonic. But in the recent years, I learned how to do it better. I stopped using an acidic cleaner. I'm using, I'm using this cleaner now. This is a Sono Swiss Cleaner T3. It's a alkaline cleaner. It's excellent at root and dissolving and removing anything grease or fat based or oil based that's my understanding at least I'm not a chem chemist and i try to keep the buff at around 50 degrees c so i'm not cooking parts to death and also i exchange the bath more often or take measures to keep the bath clean in this case, um, that's what I do often. I use a pickle jar with the cleaning solution in it in the ultrasonic cleaner. And you should not have, have it sit in the ultrasonic bath touching the actual bath because this will damage the, the stainless steel top here. So uh, we take the basket like this. and run it like this and now we can clean our small parts in the, the pickle jar with the solution and 
not mess up the whole bath if we have a very dirty part. Just this little amount and this can easily be gotten ridden off. And don't drain this stuff down the, uh, down the sink. Collect it and dispose it properly. Especially when you clean a lot of oil and grease and dirt. So uh, where do we start? My, my setup in here in the shop, I don't have a sink in the shop, so I have to, to improvise a little bit. I have the ultrasonic cleaner here. And right in front of it, I have one of those plastic Euro boxes with uh, nothing but clear water, clear cold water. And my usual procedure is I clean the part in the ultrasonic cleaner up here, either by submerging it in the bath or just holding it with tweezers or a, a wire hook into the bath, move it, agitate it a little bit until the part seems clean or is clean. Then I drop it in, in here in the clear water without a cleaning solution, rinse it and blow it dry with compressed air or before that I rinse it again with isopropyl alcohol to dry it off completely. Uh, this water is, it's, it can leave residue when it dries. The, um, the isopropane alcohol does not. Depends on what you're doing. If you're doing lab, lab grade stuff, um, you need to rinse it with isopropane alcohol. Or clean acetone is also good. So, uh, one thing that I do a lot is cleaning ER collet nuts. ER collet nuts have this have this eccentric ring in here that we don't machine away uh, because this holds the collet in and allows the collet to be removed from the holder again. It pulls the collet out. But there is always dirt and gunk collecting behind here, especially if you run um, a minimum quantity uh, cooling system on a mill or a lathe, like a, a Fogbuster spray. And it collects small chips and also oil, and these migrate down onto this taper, this precision surface down here, and compromise the run out of your collet. So it's a good idea to keep those collet nuts clean on a, on, on a semi-regular basis. And this is a case where I just hook them up and move them in the bath manually. Turn it off quickly because it's loud. So rinsing. And here we're back with all the chips and all the oil removed. This cleaner does an excellent job of removing uh, oils and grease and the parts come out free of, of it. Uh, this is not an endorsement for uh, Sono Swiss. There are other cleaners that do a very good job too. Um, the other cleaning solution I use is a highly alkalic um, industrial kitchen cleaner or commercial kitchen cleaner. Works also excellent and is cheaper than the Sono Swiss stuff. So that's the ER colored nut cleaned. Same for 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 your collets. You always have a little bit of of chips and stuff like in, in between the slots that can migrate out onto the surfaces and compromise run out that way. Uh, of course, you can blow the the chips off, but if there is oil in the equation, that's a little bit. It gets tougher to blow stuff off. That's where the ultrasonic cleaner shines.
Yeah. There are the collets clean. Good to go back in storage. Usually, if I had collets set up in a holder for a long period of time, and I tear down the, the tool holder and the collets, I will clean them in here, or when I do a changeover of tools. Good idea. Uh, makes your tools last longer because you don't press chips into the sides of your collets or your uh, tool holder tapers. And you can already see that off after cleaning a few parts, uh, the solution in the pickle jar here already gets dirtier than the bath surrounding it. And that's the whole idea behind using, using this uh, pickle jar. Uh, reduces the amount of, of actual solution in the bath that we, that we have to change out. This, is, this is, is less material to change than the whole bath. Plus changing the bath is a pain. And another thing to consider is the ultrasonic will damage parts if you leave them in too long, just by cavitation. We can demonstrate that with the old aluminum foil trick. So let's turn off the light. And as you can see, uh, the ultrasonic damaged the aluminum and, and it has holes in it now. And this will happen with actual parts too. The ultrasonic, this is not damage done by the cleaner. This will happen with pure clean distilled water too. So be careful, uh, don't leave parts in too long. Also, if you wear glasses, like I do, uh, ultrasonic clean is great. Um, it will get rid of all the gunk that collect in the in the joints back here where the, the these arms connect to the body of the glasses frame. Uh, just make sure you wash up all wash off all the cleaner after we're done, so you don't get the alkaline cleaner in your face. That would be bad. And finally, I have some footage on small hole drilling using a pyramid shaped spotting drill which i will do a separate video on because these things are awesome um, if you have any capability of grinding tools in your shop even a milling machine with a diamond wheel and an indexing head you can make these they are robust they are they work excellent and they are cheap so uh, only only positives in my mind. I, I ground a few of them and I use them a lot. So let, let's look at the footage here. This is the pyramid shaped spotting drill that I was taking about and here I'm taking just a very very small center spot for the drill to start in. I will talk about this or show this pyramid drill in a second in more detail in CAD. Now I'm changing to a one millimeter PCB drill. PCB drills are great for drilling small holes. They are very cheap, they are carbide and they have an excellent grind. As you can see when the drill starts it produces two very even chips. It cuts very freely and um, the material we're drilling here is German silver or nickel silver. Or nickel brass I think um, and as you can see it, it's just going in there we're drilling full length of the drill here that's about uh, I think nine millimeters nine times diameter here uh, so that works beautifully of course I'm not drilling with the tail stock because that's way too slow I'm using the carriage and the drill chuck is held in the quick change tool post of the lathe that's the reason why I can retract and go back and bore so quickly. So this is the actual tool that I used for spot drilling. This is a pyramid shaped piece of carbide. So this for example is three millimeter in diameter and has three flats ground onto it, evenly spaced at 120 degrees apart. So they form with their, this creates three cutting edges. 
cutting edge edges have a highly negative cutting action. As you can see, this is more a scraping action than a positive cutting action, but they work surprisingly well in almost all materials that I used so used them in so far. And here is a piece with a matching spot drill. And as you can see, these edges are contacting the taper of the bore. That also means that the flats that we have to grind on here are not in case of a 90 degree uh, spot drill here. Uh, these flats are not at 45 degree. That's a compound angle problem once again. And I decided to solve it here in CAD. Let's remove the part with the counter sink here. So I put in this triangle that's perpendicular on this flat that we need to grind and goes through the center. And this is this is the angle that we need to grind. Uh, how do we inspect this? Uh, edit sketch. And then we can place a dimension from here to here. And that's 36.4 degree. That's what we need to grind this this flat three times, evenly spaced all around, to get a tool that looks like this and creates a shape like this. Let's have the drill in here. Here you can see, here one of the three cutting edges is in contact with the conical shape here. And back here, this is the basically the relief surface of the next cutting surface and also the chip cutting surface of the uh, following edge. So it's a little bit of a weird geometry, but it works. I didn't invent this. Um, this is a commercial product sold by Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi Carbide Tooling something something something. And they sell this as a 3mm shanked tool with a ground from carbide and it's even coated and it's it's their solution for centering small and smallest drills. And I have to say it works. It really works. I, I was made aware of these by um, Danny Rudolph on Instagram. He is, um, he is running Swiss Lace in his garage basically and that's where I learned about this drill. Also my friend Josh Hacko from Australia who is a watchmaker uh, he sells these. He sells them in different tip angles. These are also if you grind them steeper excellent triangular scrapers, pre precision triangular scrapers for very very fine cuts and very fine deburring. And the the steeper or the the more towards ninety degrees you make them, the better they are for centering drills. Uh, there is a limitation in in the relationship of the um, of the spot drill angle that you can create. At some point, this whole thing gets too negative and doesn't work anymore. Just like people, if they are too negative, they don't work anymore. And then we have another elephant in the room. And this elephant is a new surface grinder. <laughs> the Bima FSM 260 that I ordered three months ago arrived. And I wanted to quickly talk about this machine and uh, the decision process behind buying it. So I have my small LIP 515 surface grinder, which is a really good, nice, small industrial machine. But it's very small and also it's worn. Um, I rescraped the table, the table traverse. It grinds very, very straight, but the cross traverse needs work. Also, the vertical columns need work. And since I use these machines for, for the business side, I had to take a decision. I was looking for either a very good used machine or a new machine. Used machines, small surface grinders in Europe are 
terrible to find. Uh, the biggest machine I was looking for was something like a Herrick 6x12 and those are almost non-existent. Some came over here as centerless grinders but they are rare as can be. So that led nowhere. Then I was looking into new machines and the smallest surface grinders you can get new are either Lipmac which is the company that used to be Lip, which made my surface grinder. But those machines are really, really expensive if you want a little bit of equipment and also very heavy. This shop, the side of the shop has a concrete ceiling and a concrete floor, solid concrete. But on this side where, where the CNC and the grinders are is there is a, a basement beneath this. Um, a, an, an, a basement that's accessible from the outside. It's unheated, it's just storage. But uh, I don't want to overconstrain the ceiling with a machine that weighs like a ton, like a, a 6x18 surface grinder. A Komodo 350 surface grinder. Excellent small machine. A friend of mine has a used one and it, it's, it's really a beautiful machine. Huge travel. But it's also bloody heavy and I was very worried putting something like this in here. So I had a little bit of a weight constraint. Then I remembered that about 15 years ago or something like that on Euromold, that's a trade show here for mold making, making, prototyping and the like, I saw a tiny surface grinder. A completely manual surface grinder with a nice high 90 RO, a reasonable large travels and back then I asked the people how much this grinder is and I think they said something like 20,000 euros and I was thinking hmm, one day one day one of these grinders could be an option for me back in the day I was still a hobbyist in, in the process of looking for a surface grinder I reminded that or I it, it, it came up to my mind that this this company existed and Lo and behold, they still exist and they still make grinders and they still make pantograph engravers and duplicator machines and all sorts of weird, wonderful machines. I will put, will put a link to the company down in the description. And so I shoot them an email for a quote for this grinder and the quote that came back was, hi, it's an expensive machine. There is no doubt about it, but it, I didn't fall off my chair so I, I followed up and I drove to the company I, I looked at their facility where they built the machine the machine is completely built here in Germany they have nice Hermlin milling machines CNC 5 axis and surface grinding capabilities and also we visited a tool and die shop which has three of these grinders the oldest one being like 30 years old and they used the heck out of it. So I got the, I had the opportunity to play with the grinder there, uh, grind a little bit, feel how, how this operation, because this machine is a very uncommon layout. I have never seen anything like this before. So that, that gave me the confidence to, to purchase this machine. I, I, I spec the machine with the accessories that I wanted. It's not much that I needed in, in addition. It were very expensive options, but not very many. <laughs> so then I got a second quote. The whole process again, you get the quote, you, you talk to the people and then you order the machine and then you wait for three months. And then one day you schedule your freight company and the freight company arrives one day early as usual, sets the machine out in the driveway in the rain and leaves without a notice as usual. And in a hurry, you set up a, you, you, you gather uh, some helping hands and a pallet check and you move the machine into the shop and here it is. It's a beautiful machine, very accurate for what it is or very accurate period not for what it is it's a very accurate machine so the general layout is let's take this rack here off this is protecting the magnet the general layout is 
that's you, you sit in front of the grinder like this right hand goes here on this hand wheel on the side this is the table traverse normally you would sit a little bit more to the right but it's easier for filming this way so this hand operates the table traverse or like this or like this or you can roll your hand around it's very very ergonomic because the right hand in my case being a right-handed person is my strong hand and my dominant hand and I have a lot of force in here to operate this table. Now normal, normal surface grinder, your left hand does the table traverse. We have a wheel head up here that traverses side to side. So that's this direction. We have a hand wheel on both sides depending on how you operate the machine but most of the time you will use uh, this on this side. And you have a hand wheel down here, which is the elevation of the head. The complete crossbar with the head moves up and down. So that's, that's already very neat. We have fairly large travels for such a compact machine. We have 260 millimeters of table traverse back and forth. We have 180 millimeters side to side and we have 200 and 220 or 240 millimeter between the wheel with a 125 millimeter wheel between the wheel and the table with the magnet a little bit less of course but um, this also gives you options you can st hang stuff off the magnet and do other weird things which i will talk later about so that's the general layout we have a belt driven spindle flat belt 0.25 kilowatt three phase motor 400 volts we have a Heidenheim DRO and also we have a tilting head on this machine you loosen the center it has two tapered pins that you pull out I already did then you loosen the center bolt then you can tilt the spindle head the whole spindle assembly tilts 45 degree in either direction which is rather cool. <laughs> it's less interesting for grinding angles and bevels, but more interesting if you want to do side wheeling. If you, if you want to grind a vertical wall with the side of a wheel, which is always a little bit annoying because you have a very large contact patch with the grinding wheel. You can just kick it a few degrees off vertical, redress the side of the wheel, and redress the bottom of the wheel to be per perpendicular to the machine's travels and then do your side wheeling and uh, flat grinding that way. That's a very neat option. And when, we, when you want to go back you just go back to zero, clean out the two tapered bores and put the tapered pins back in. And then you lock it in place. So that, that's the general layout of this machine. And yes, it's a crazy expensive machine, especially for its size. I could have bought a Haas Mini Mill for the same money, almost. It doesn't have any slideways. It's all cross roller bearing guides in all axes, which is very nice because those wear extremely slow or extremely easy moving which is important on a manual operated grinder I can tell you because the lip is a uh, double V flat arrangement and after a day of grinding your left arm will fall off. Uh, we have Heidenhain uh, linear scales on both axes and the readout here and the readout is set so it, it it has a one micron resolution and being Heidenhain this is reasonable good quality <laughs> the, these you can trust these uh, measurements of these linear scales there is no doubt about them the bellows are, are have some axial pins in here and are held with set screws here on this end plate and you just loosen those set screws which I already did and then you push those pins out in a controlled manner like this and then we get full access to the 
to the C-axis slide here. The screw is trapezoidal thread, which is fine for a manual machine. There is a preloaded nut back there, so we have zero backlash when we turn the screw. And here are the guideways. These are Schneeberger style cross roller guides. You have a V here, a V down here, and the moving part has the same V. And you have rollers that are opposed to each other and create a bearing arrangement. These are crazy stiff, long lasting, and very smooth and easy running. Ugh. So that's a basic arrangement. And here you can see that it's, it's an extrusion that has been machined and ground and then hard coated. And that's where these uh, slideways sit on. And also this bellow sits up here in this ridge. So it forms another barrier for dust to come in. So if you don't do anything stupid like compressed air against the bellows, this is a very safe and sound way of, of protecting the ways. Get this back, get the pins back in. So this is a very simple arrangement to hold the bellows, but I prefer this over what other companies do and use Velcro for the for the way covers, that's always a little bit annoying. And we will do the same for the X drive of the table. Okay, I pulled the X, the X travel covers back and you can see the same cross roller bearing guides here with the bearing packs in here, with the roller packs in here. Same aluminum construction here. And in addition, you see here the chain this is what drives the table. This goes down over, over this idler wheel and somehow loops around the hand wheel and goes somewhere back to the back side of the table again and moves the table like this. I'm not sure how they get it to, to run backlash free. Uh, chain drives usually have backlash, I guess. But I checked it with an indicator and there is a uh, virtually no backlash. They are either, either spring-loaded some way or I'm not sure. Um, I'm not too keen to take it apart completely. Uh, this is as much as I want to go into the, the guts of this machine since this is a brand new machine and uh, not exactly a, a 500 euro debit grinder. I, I know that people will ask how much this grinder costs and I can tell you a lot. Uh, this is a serious investment for me and for, my, for the business side of me. Uh, baseline price of this machine is slightly below 30,000 euros bef with, before tax, sorry, before tax. So um, it's not exactly a hobby grade machine, I know. Uh, and it's not my intent to, to brag about this machine because uh, buying this machine was purely a business side decision, not a I want this machine. Well, it's a little bit of I want this machine too, but primarily this machine is here to work. And it's a cool machine. <laughs> don't, don't, let's, let's not be kidding. Uh, it's an absolutely cool machine. It's well built. It's made here in Germany. Um, and it took me, it took me, it took me some time to, to earn the money to buy this machine. And I'm really, really happy to have this machine in the shop. And so now we have it back together, bellows in place again. Let's, let's look at some grinding setups with, with this machine, especially with a spin fixture, because that's something I, I do quite a bit. This would be some regular surface grinding work. This is the tool length probe of my CNC router. And somebody crashed a tool into it. And there is a nice mark up here that I already stoned when I needed this probe to be used. The style of probe has a set screw here on the side 
to lock the plunger from movement when you resurface it. From factory, these are surfaced with large uh, face mill, but since we have a surface grinder here, we can also do a little bit of grinding on it. So we have, of course, back here our DRO. Put a little bit of blue marker on here, just to, so we see what's going on. We turn on the spindle and then we do our regular surface grinding check. I bolted the probe to a to a block, to a parallel ground block, because the probe body itself is aluminum and its aluminum magnets are quite rare. So let's turn on the spin, let's clear the spindle, turn it on. This is now basically the operator's view when you run the machine and do very delicate work. Then you look straight down onto the wheel and you have your work here right now, nicely out of focus, but when you, when you move it in, uh, we get nicely in focus. And as you can see, you get an excellent view. Normally you would go with your view level a little bit lower like this. And then you really see what's going on. There is a, a Laxam shield in front of the machine that I removed. It somehow got lost. I'm not sure how that happened. Might be located in the, in the cabinet under the machine right now. But uh, it's still absolutely safety glass area here. And if something happens, the wheel will go this way. Or parts, uh, I will say. Parts will go that way, not my way. So, uh, but usually you sit, if you do actual grinding and not just touch off work and very delicate work, you sit offset to the left, not looking straight down on the wheel, uh, which is safer this way. Um, now we're back in a normal orientation to looking at the part and Took a final pass and as, as you can see when I bring my pen in here. This is an okay finish. Uh, this is a 46 grit wheel which is not exactly very fine. I would have also a 100 grit wheel which loads up within half a second. Uh, 60 or 80 might be ideal for this kind of work. Uh, but still, it would also benefit from a slightly finer dress or smaller cross traverse but but this is an absolutely serviceable finish and uh, i'm very happy with it a very important use case for me is the punch grinder uh, i i acquired this punch grinder some time ago it's it's a very precise and very useful way of work holding indexing and spinning work on grinders and milling machines and my lip surface grinder is honestly too small to fully utilize this item. But the BMAR grinder is absolutely large enough to, to handle fairly large work with this indexing head. Currently it's offset off the magnet a little bit with, uh, with some blocks. By the way, when you, uh, when you run a surface grinder, make yourself blocks without any holes. Otherwise you have a cleaning nightmare concept cleaning nightmare. Uh, solid blocks are way easier to handle and if you don't need the holes, why put them in? So let's see how, how large we can grind here. So this is the extreme uh, C position of the wheel in this direction and in height, I think. Oh, we can even go a little bit higher. So means if I, I can either grind relatively long pieces in here or relatively large pieces too, or if I move the head over and have the work hang over off the magnet, I can, I can grind fairly large discs here. 
And if, if I'm really in a pickle, I st can still remove the magnet and uh, get, get out of a pickle that way. But what's really cool about this grinder is the, the position of the, of the operator when, when doing grinding. You look straight down onto the wheel or if you have a slight safety concern, like 45 or 30 degrees against the wheel, like here. And visibility is just brilliant. Due to the table moving towards and away from you, uh, you just move it towards you if you want to inspect your work. Do some measurement, and then you go back against the table stop. Do your grinding, and come back, do inspection and so forth. The column is a very fine pitch. This is one millimeter per rev, which is perfectly fine for a surface grinder because we need the fine down feed for surface grinding. And when doing spin grinding, it's also very important to have a fine down feed because that controls your diameter. So, so for, for spin grinding, you would go here, you would lock the table in an ideal case just by using the stops so it's in, it's in a fixed position and we don't crash. And also, it would be good to lock the work because it's not. And also lock the V-block on the spin fixture, which it's not because this is just a mock-up setup. But while we're here, we can do some, well, let's make some sparks here. Also the hand crank is so um, we're grinding an eccentric part here because I didn't bother to, to center the work in this case. So see, wheel spins free, our spin fixture spins free, good to go. Uh, spindle, nice and quiet, really quiet. And we drop down onto the work and we zero out our DRO. And then we start grinding. We drop the wheel slowly and also hand crank the spin fixture at the same time. And there we go. There's our, uh, let's say this is a cam pin because it's a nice eccentric pin. Uh, this is high speed steel, by the way. Ground with a 46 grit aluminum oxide wheel hardness J, which is, uh, I got this recommended by a grinding wheel manufacturer for uh, small surface grinder and these work very well. and also are reasonable cheap. I think one of these wheels was like 12 euros. And you get a lot of life out of a 125 millimeter wheel. Especially when working with hardened materials, grinding wheel, uh, the cost compared to hard milling on grinding is uh, very interesting. On hard milling end mill, 20 to 50 bucks, that lasts maybe a few hours in the cut with moderate material removal and uh, a grinding wheel with for 12 euros can remove a ton more material in total. So overall a grinding wheel is a very cost efficient way of material removal. Even if grinders are not especially considered uh, material removal machines more like finishing machines. But uh, there is truth to both. So that's grinding with the spin fixture on the BMA grinder. So here is a long lost friend, my cylindrical grinding fixture to grind between centers. There is a build video 
uh, I think something like three or four years ago when I built this and I use it on and off. I don't get too much between sand or grinding work, but when I do, um, this is very useful. And as you can see, this also fits the grinder extremely well. Um, I usually hold this in a vise because when I want to grind the taper, I can just tilt it, rest the sign bar on here and get my angle for, for um, using a sign bar very precisely. And it's very fast set up that way in a grinding vise. Also, as, as before, we have a huge work envelope this way. I can almost use the full length of the grinding fixture here. Uh, yeah, I, I can use the full length of the grinding fixture. And also use the maximum diameter that this fixture allows. So that, that's very nice. As you can see, full, full traverse. Uh, this is just a gauge pin that I clamped between centers here so you get an idea how this looks with a workpiece. You can do your grinding and you can quickly traverse it away from the wheel to do your inspection, uh, measuring with micrometers, checking run out, uh, inspecting the finish and whatever you need to do. Also for changing out parts if you run multiples, uh, this is ideal. Also, this is a little bit too tight. Ugh. There we go. So, also for changing out parts on here, this is this is really neat. But I will rebuild this fixture because there are design decisions that I took at the time that are not very good. Uh, for example, the integral uh, drive. I don't you. I don't like it. Uh, Especially as I put it on the spring-loaded side, this always pulls to the side and the off-center mass, as small as it is, introduces a tiny bit of out-of-roundness. So uh, I will redesign this without a motor. I will just use an external drive like uh, when I do my spindle regrinds where I use the hacked up electric uh, screwdriver to drive to work via a O-ring drive. Just like uh, Robin Ransetti shows very often on, on his YouTube channel and on his Instagram. So that's what I'm going to do. But this is really neat. I like this a ton. So and again, with the, if I tilted the spindle a little bit and, and dress the wheel square and perpendicular again, I can grind up to shoulders very, very nicely on this machine now. So that's an added bonus here. So then another common setup for me is to regrind grill press spindles for some reason. And here is the set I be used to use. I held the spindle in a grinding vise and I bumped it around with a copper drift until I get it to the right angle in the vise. Because my lip surface grinder is too small to accommodate a proper sign bar or sign plate to tilt the work. And here is a mock-up setup with a sign plate, a magnetic V-block and a 40 millimeter piece of round stock as a drill press spindle stand in because I didn't have a spindle to grind at the time in the shop. And as you can see, there is still plenty of room to move around and grind the end of the spindle. And the sign plate allows for very easy setup of the angle without bumping things around forever. And here, once again, the results I get by grinding the drill press spindles this way. The runout on the taper is as good as the bearings of the drill press spindle run, which is usually pretty good for deep proof ball bearings. And here it's with a decent quality room drill chuck, still darn good. So 
So if you made it that far into the video, sorry, you really need to seek help. But I absolutely appreciate if you made it that far and watched so far without skipping 90% of the video. So thank you all for watching. Thanks for the support and I'll be back.